Hello, I'm Dr. DeBellis. Today I'm going to continue talking to you about evolution of the brain and behavior. Now, you're probably familiar with the topic that we just discussed, the theory of evolution. Now we're going to talk about evolution in animals. After that, we're going to talk about evolution in hominids. So, a quick review. Charles Darwin's hypothesis was that reproduction will increase a population rapidly unless factors limit it. And individuals of a species are not identical, which is pretty obvious. Now, some variation is inherited, even though he didn't understand why, and not all offspring survive to reproduce. Whenever we look at the, um, the English peppered moth, uh, remember that mutations cause variation. Some peppered moths are very dark, the other ones are very light over on the left. Um, it used to be that crows would actually, or birds would actually prey on the darker colored peppered moths, um, and that's the reason that peppered moths were usually light colored. However, after the Industrial Revolution in 1760, suet deposition caused the buildings to become dark, and therefore the lighter colored pepper moths were, um, stood out more, more readily to predators. Therefore, the darker pepper moths actually managed to survive better, so they were more fit due to this change in the environment. So favorable mutations are, are clearly going to favor one's likelihood to reproduce. Again, natural selection relies on two things. Do you survive long enough to rep reproduce? And then how many times does an individual reproduce? Now, homoplasy is due to convergent evolution. It's whenever species that are, that are different, they're not related, start to utilize the same adaptations, like the wing folds of a flying squirrel, the wings of a, of a bee, and the wings of a hawk all serve the purpose of allowing a species to use the air as a form of transportation. However, they're not actually related. We call this uh, homoplasy, and it's an example of convergent evolution. Now, homology is a similarity based on common ancestry, as are forelimbs. An analogy refers to similar function, such as a human hand or an elephant's trunk which are analogous even though they look differently. Now remember, mutations are spontaneous changes in genes, a rapid form of evolution, which was discovered by de Vry, and um, genetics is the study of the mechanisms of inheritance. And it began with Mendel and de Vry. Oftentimes when we study genetics, we like to utilize the Drosophila fly. It's a type of fly that reproduces very rapidly, um, and it also has these, um, these large chromosomes that are available um, in the salivary glands, which make it really easy to study. Now, taxonomy is the classification of organisms. Um, a fossil record can help date an organism, and DNA analysis can quantify the differences between species as well as uh, estimate their divergence from a common ancestor through the rate of DNA decay. Now, the father of modern taxonomy was Carl Linnaeus, and, and in, in Linnaeus's system, which is still used, um, each species has two names. There's the genus, and then there's the species. The genus is a group of species that resemble each other, and a species is a group of individuals that can interbreed and produce fertile offspring. Now, kingdom is the highest level, and all living creatures can be divided into the five basic kingdoms. Some say that there's a different number, there's a little bit of discrepancy, a little bit of debate on this, but uh, for the purpose of this class, we're going to say there's a kingdom Animalia, Plantae, Fungi, Monera, and Protista. There are also many different theories on how many kingdoms there are. Now, a phylum is a subdivision of a kingdom. An example of that would be for um, animalia. It would be like vertebrates. Um, now, a class is a subdivision of a phylum, such as mammalia. 
Um, and then a subdivision of that would be order, subdivision of that family, and then finally back to genus and species. Now, a phylogeny is the evolutionary history of a particular group of organisms, and it may be represented as a family tree. You see, different species show different solutions to environmental changes, and uh, living animals along with fossils allow us to study the body and its relationship to the brain as it's adapting to the environment. Some points I wanted to bring up, and they were really eloquently stated by Brett Pelham, who actually wrote a nice textbook on evolutionary psychology. Um, he makes sure to say that evolution is slow. It's almost two billion years evolution's been occurring. So it's been happening for a very, very long time. And sometimes you don't see much ev evidence of evolution in humans uh, in a long period of time. Also, it's pretty conservative, unfortunately. Uh, for instance, serotonin was pretty useful for um, less complex organisms such as lobsters so that they could actually um, regulate their social order. Higher serotonin levels in lobsters are associated with higher social status. Whenever lobsters um, win a territorial dispute, the winning lobster usually has higher serotonin levels subsequent to winning the loser has lower levels. As a result of serotonin uh, increase, the winner actually stands more erect with a broader posture. It um, sig signifies a higher social status, and you find the opposite in the loser. Um, this can be demonstrated by using things like SSRIs. We can actually demonstrate SSRIs actually also exert this effect on lobsters. And we don't find that serotonin is just used in lobsters for social order. I talked in the beginning of this semester about the vervet monkeys um, in Raleigh et al. study and how they actually, um, you can uh, determine their relative rank in, in a social hierarchy by looking at serotonin metabolites, which are a rough indicator of what their serotonin levels are. And higher levels correlate positively with higher social status disrupting social order, putting the alpha male in, in behind a one-way glass where it feels like it's being ghosted by the entire tribe will actually lead to these, these dramatic declines in serotonin levels. Um, in human beings, we also find serotonins associated with social worth and status. Uh, we find it also in canines. It's really fascinating. So, uh, nature is kind of conservative that way. It actually, if something's working, um, it tends to be preserved. So you could say evolution, one of the mottos of evolution might be, if it's not broken, then don't fix it. Evolution also comes with baggage. For instance, it was one that once adaptive um, to prefer sweet food. However, these days, sweets are not so adaptive. They're actually not very healthy. Um, also, predispositions to things like phobias. Um, it's, uh, these days, the things that we have phobias about are oftentimes much less uh, threatening than things like motorcycles or cigarettes. You never hear of somebody having a fear of, of you know, um, these sorts of things, a phobia. But when it comes to scorpions or poisonous snakes, um, even though there aren't a whole lot of poisonous snakes in many areas of the country. Also, evolution implies continuity, and it is very orderly, according to Pelham. And I completely agree with him on that. And now that we've made those points, I want to digress. Um, here's a really nice uh, picture that I took when I was in the Museum of Natural History in um, New York City. Um, this, all, the, all the phylogenetic differences when you look on the phylogenetic scale there, you see skates and sharks, and you see uh, a, a uh, swordfish, and it's really amazing. Um, I highly recommend that you check this out if you get a chance. It's one of the most amazing visual displays. You can see some shells over there on the left. It's really quite impressive. So now let's talk about evolution in animals. So... Roughly 20 million years ago, a large meteorite 
struck the Yucatan Peninsula. There's the Yucatan Peninsula there. Um, whenever this happened, um, thick clouds of dust, tsunamis, and earthquakes made the earth difficult for dinosaurs to inhabit. And uh, the Morgana could own was um, a small insect-eating rat-like proto-mammal able to find a niche in this difficult setting. It looks kind of like a rat, doesn't it? Very resilient, able to um, regulate its own temperature um, so it doesn't need as much sunlight. It's very good at finding things to eat, eat all sorts of things. Eventually, the dinosaurs couldn't keep up with this, this new climate, so they became extinct, and mammals diversified from uh, this, this, this particular, we call it sometimes the morgi. Um, and we share common ancestry with chimpanzees from five million years ago, but we're most related to bonobos. If you think of the relationship between um, bonobos and other primates, bonobos are akin to domesticated dogs. Other primates are akin to wolves. So bonobos are sort of like the most domestic, the most human-like, um, and they seem to be the most advanced whenever it comes to language acquisition and development. So we have a common ancestor. Um, we have common ancestors before us. Uh, let me see here. Okay, there was a common ancestor between us and old world monkeys that was 25 to 30 million years ago. And down there in the beginning, we see an old world monkey. We see a baboon, which uh, we're going to hear a lot about baboons when we get to Robert Sapolsky's lectures. After that, about 15 to 20 million years ago, we share a common ancestor with gibbons. And uh, uh, there's some gibbons there. They're really fun to watch. They like to swing. They like to uh, um, uh, swing from branches. They're remarkably good at it. Then 12 to 16 million years ago, there, we shared a common ancestor with orangutans. And then 6 to 8 million, we see uh, we shared an ancestor with um, gorillas. And then four to six years ago, that's when we diverged with a common ancestor. Uh, there are hominids there. That one right there is, uh, I think that one is uh, genus and species, my son, or Leonardo. And then finally, um, four to six million after that, we had the bonobos. And, uh, and then finally, um, the chimpanzees. Now, why is it important to study animals? Well, Researching animals gives rise to medical treatments and deeper understanding of our own physiology. It also aids with conservation and economic gains. And then finally, studying animals also can be a more convenient way to study issues such as evolution. One of my complaints about um, life here is one of my favorite things about it. We have to keep track of everything. You know, every time you make a dollar, you have to write it down so the IRS doesn't come chasing you down. Every time you catch a fish, you've got to write it down, mail it in to, um, to uh, the government. But that's a good thing because whenever we're considering whether we need to release water uh, that's dammed up in order to help the salmon to not uh, be impacted or whenever we have to determine how we can better conserve on the environment, those vital statistics become very valuable. And we're lucky that we have them so that we can take good care of nature. Now, when it comes to animal evolution, one of my favorite studies was by uh, Takahisa et al. in 2004. Have you ever wondered why when you're nervous, you, you kind of freeze, you don't move, some people even faint? Well, one of the reasons positive for this is because it makes you look dead. And most predators don't want to eat dead prey, right? Talk to a fisherman and they'll tell you, for certain fish, you know, you have to move the lure. If the lure just sinks to the bottom of the, the, the lake, they, they're not interested in it. They want something that's live. Um, this is also seen whenever we look at arachnids, such as spiders, as well as beetles. And Takahisa 
and his colleagues did this really interesting study where what they did is they bred um, red flower beetles for tonic immobility. This means that those individuals, those beetles, whenever they saw a dangerous spider, they'd freeze. So that was an experimental condition. In the control condition, they basically chose beetles that were not bred for tonic immobility. And what they found was, over time, it was more adaptive to actually have tonic immobility because these Adonson jumping spiders would not consume the um, beetles, the red flower beetles that, that um, would pretend to play dead. They would freeze whenever they saw a spider. Therefore, they didn't look as suitable as food. And this was a demonstration of how you can actually watch evolution occur. Um, and this was done, again, with beetles and spiders. Really fascinating study. Now, we've seen um, adaptation in, in, in other animal species, sometimes in their natural habitat. Um, another important adaptation is the ability to learn in order to find food and avoid danger. Uh, we see that with crows and sparrows, for instance. Um, for instance, uh, certain birds will actually drop um, food on tombstones or on rocky shores in order to crack it open, things like shellfish, mollusks. Um, also, some birds will actually go to a truck stop because they know they can feast on the grills of these, these big rigs that have lots of bugs that have been in the front grill for some time. So this is an innovative strategy. Um, and we notice that these particular birds have larger forebrains because they engage in this kind of planning and strategizing in order to um, master their environments. Now, in some species of songbirds, and we have one of those songbirds up, up in the upper right-hand corner, um, song repertoires are adaptive behaviors. It's kind of like humans, right? If you're out on a date and some guy just keeps playing the same Justin Bieber song on a CD player the whole drive, don't, doesn't it kind of ruin things? Um, it's the same way for these songbirds. If they can actually learn more repertoires of songs, they actually are more, um, they're more attractive to potential partners. And it's found that those with uh, larger repertoires of songs have a, high, have a larger, higher vocal center, which is akin to kind of our Broca's area. Now, more innovative species have larger forebrains, as I pointed out, that allow them to utilize automobiles or headstones to deshell nuts or collect insects, drop nuts over a road, and, and then let the cars break it apart. And birds that store food for later use, as well as voles, they, um, they have um, larger hippocampi because hippocampi are important for locating things that you've hidden. For instance, um, there's something called caching. Caching is taking um, things and hiding them somewhere, right? So let's say you have a key for your home, and if you ever get locked out, you have a backup key that you hid somewhere in your yard. You have to be able to actually find it in order to utilize it. Um, sometimes people do the shopping, right? Oh, wow, that's the last Red Bull. Well, let me hide it here in this... Uh, orange juice section way in the very back and then I can come back once I grab my wallet and I can actually recover it and purchase something. Well that's what voles do um, and uh, a, a particular type of vole utilizes this strategy to have more mates. Um, so and some birds they hide food, they'll even hide eggs. So. So in the midbrain, the inferior colliculi are more, much larger for bats that depend on hearing in order to navigate. Um, this isn't surprising because the inferior colliculi are, are the ones involved in hearing. And if that's what determines how well they navigate, you would expect over evolution those areas that are used more often would grow. Bats that depend on sight have larger superior colliculi again. Mm -hmm. This is going to be really important to avoid having accidents while 
your you know, flying if you use sight to navigate. And again, as noted before, songbirds um, have this higher vocal center. When we talk about animal intelligence, we're always bombarded with research by Jane Goodall and primatologists, and, and it's all centered on primates. It's mostly centered on bonobos, chimpanzees, uh, baboons, but there was an individual in Pennsylvania who decided this is all wrong. What we need to do is we need to study canines. He explained to a professor in undergrad that his dog was incredibly smart and would make a good research candidate. I don't think that his comment was received as well as he'd hoped. So he did what all people do when they get in a disagreement with a professor. They become a professor themselves. And he made his area of study, and I believe his name was Brian Hare. Um, he made his, his studies uh, centered on canine intelligence. Now, canine intelligence makes them great species for domestication as well as service animals. You, it's common to find these, these dogs in the military helping people. Uh, service dogs. Um, when's the last time you saw a service bonobo at the at the mall, right? It's not real common, but you see service dogs a lot. So he argued that canines exhibit sophisticated communication skills. And his research shows that their ability to deductively reason and their theory of mind are actually quite impressive. When it comes to um, uh, gestural inferences, perhaps they were better than primates. Um, so up in the upper right hand side we, we actually see a service dog that works with the military. Um, these dogs, there's a lot of time put into training them. There's a lot of time put into selecting them. They're very expensive. Oftentimes uh, they have $80,000 suits that they wear. Um, some of them have tungsten teeth uh, or titanium teeth I think. And um, they, they're in school all day, every day. So one of the things that um, Dr. Hare pointed, pointed out was this comparison of animals, you know, where we say, well, poodles are smarter than German shepherds. That's not necessarily true. We have to look at experience as well. While an untrained poodle might be slightly more intelligent on average than a German shepherd, the German shepherds and the Malinois that are actually um, in service in the military, they're in school all day, every day for over a decade. So they're naturally going to be a lot smarter than, you know, a, a poodle that goes to PetSmart once a week. So um, now Ludmila Trup was a Russian ethologist and she developed domesticated foxes from wild silver foxes. And her research provides compelling evidence that foxes undergo dramatic changes in makeup when they're bred and domesticated. Um, now, control foxes were not chosen for domestication since they're less approachable, but the experimental foxes went on to have physical and behavioral changes. So these are the ones that liked humans more, and then they go to live with humans and then they would be bred with others that lived with humans. So they were becoming more and more domesticated. And finally, the group that became domesticated, they had a, this group had higher serotonin, lower glucocorticoids, so they're less aggressive, they're less edgy, they um, feel more confident and relaxed around human beings. They also had more floppy ears, they had more curly tails, star mutations. Again, these are things human beings really like. And the experimental line was also very good at understanding human gestures. I referred to this as a gestural inference earlier, um, but they were really good with this. Now I want to say, even though canines are really good at some things, they're not good at all things. Anybody who's walked their dog and watch their poor dog get tied up around a telephone pole. It always happens after you brag to your, to your friend about how smart your dog is and it nearly hangs itself on a, on a telephone pole because it can't figure out that you can't walk through a telephone pole. This is not uncommon. Graphomotor skills are not terribly good for dogs. Their spatial planning is not all that great. However, gestural inference, language, 
those are some of the strengths, and, uh, and I encourage you to look at the research on that if you have a chance. Um, now, mammals' lifestyles are related to cortical organization. Nocturnal rats that use whiskers have a large part of their cortex devoted to their whiskers, but only a little to vision. Um, the platypus is much different. It uses its bill to detect mechanical as well as electrical stimuli. And most of its somatosensory cortex is devoted to um, its bill. So if you look at a raccoon, it's quite the opposite. Um, a raccoon has a really, really large sensory motor area dedicated to its paws because it's really good at manipulating things with its digits, which is one of the reasons that they're so frustrating for homeowners who are trying to keep their garbage in the garbage can. But the, the raccoons just won't permit it, and they're so good at getting into things. Now, nervous systems vary widely in structure and complexity. We have all different types of um, structures. We have uh, nerve nets, simple ganglia, optic lobes. We have our cerebral cortex for human beings. We have all these different types of nervous system. They're very, very um, diverse. Um, and they're adapted toward the environments that they need to survive in. Now, while mammals share similar brain structures, actual and relative size of regions such as the cerebral cortex and olfactory bulbs can vary greatly. Um, in addition, human neurons are also a lot larger. But a large brain has a lot of costs that come with those benefits. Some of the costs are a long gestation period. It takes a long time to deliver a child. Um, prolonged dependence on parents. Um, children are, need their parents for such a long time. High metabolic cost. And uh, then finally, complex genes are vulnerable to mutations, which is another cost of having a large brain. So vertebrate nervous systems share certain main features, such as uh, they develop from a dorsal neural tube. Uh, they have separate peripheral and central nervous systems. Uh, there, there's a localization of function. Also, there's hierarchical control. Um, one neuroscientist uh, referred to the brain as working kind of like an Athenian democracy, where Every, every system has a system that supervises, governs, and can kind of overtake that system, you know, um, with the final system, of course, being the, the prefrontal cortex, which is kind of like the head boss. As a matter of fact, at one time when uh, uh, people were going on strike, employees in Washington, D.C., they actually said that the uh, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex of America has officially stopped working. <laughs> Um, that's a really uh, great metaphor to use with a neuroscientist. Um, uh, so the vertebrate nervous system also has bilateral symmetry as well as segmentation. So brain structures exist in common. Um, brain's ex differences exist in common structures, but the differences are not in the basic subdivisions, but the relative size. So when you look at different types of mammals, you find that different mammals have different enlarged areas of their brain. Um, and also, all mammals have a six-layer neocortex called the isocortex, and that's kind of the highest level. We have, also have limbic cortex, but that's different. So here are some different brains. Um, as you can see, with mammals, you tend to have the same exact structures. They're just larger in some animals, smaller and other ones. So I'm often asked, does a larger brain translate it to more intelligence? Right? Um, well, whales and elephants have the largest brains. And would you go as far as to say that an elephant is smarter than Bill Gates? Um, what about brain size divided by body size? Can that account for it? Well, shrews have the largest brain size compared to body size, but you never hear of shrews, you know, inventing a Silicon Valley startup. So we need a better estimate, and the best estimate is the encephalization factor. So it's a measure of brain size relative to body size, and the formula is up on the upper right, 
you basically, in the numerator, you have brain weight divided by the denominator, the body weight, which is to the multiplied by 0.69. And the relationship between brain weight and body weight is similar for all classes of vertebrates. But brain weight relative to body size does vary between and within classes. So as you can see with this encephalization factor, you're not just looking at how high up there a, a creature is. So you can see elephant and blue whale. Wait a second here. Elephant and blue whale are the highest if we look at brain divided by body. But if we plot this encephalization factor, we can actually plot lines at 90 degree angles from this hypothetical line. And we can actually measure brain size. This is Australopithecus. We're going to talk about this um, ancestor of ours um, in the following lecture. But look, the wolf, it, well, the wolf is, is smart. It, you know, we measure this line. It's not nearly as smart as you would think. The blue whale, if you look at encephalization factor, it's not as smart as you would think, but human being is the furthest up here. So even though a lion would have a larger brain, the wolf is actually um, further away from this encephalization factor. Now, brain evolution shows size changes both in specific regions and overall. And the size of each brain structure is highly correlated with the total brain size. However, the rate of increase in some brain areas can differ between small and large brains. In primates, brain regions that develop later have enlarged more than earlier regions. So larger brains have evolved by prolonging the final stages of development. And as you know, for human beings, this is going to be the prefrontal cortex, which is not fully online until about the age of 26. Now, in humans, this may explain changes in the cortex, where new neurons form the outermost layers. And if we look at development of human beings, you know, there's a really interesting story uh, about at the foothills of the Sierra Nevadas, um, there's this cliff that overlooks this beautiful landscape. And um, there's a little waterfall that goes over. And the tour guides will actually tell you that for centuries, They've been accumulating bones at the end of this water, at the bottom of this waterfall on the rocks. And these are the bones of those who decided that they could get just a little bit further off the edge and they fell. They've analyzed the bones and determined that some of them go back centuries. But the thing is, they all have one thing in common. They're all adolescent bones. And this has something to do with the under developed prefrontal cortex. As you know, the prefrontal cortex is really, really important for judgment and risk analysis. And it looks like it doesn't work as well in adolescence as it does in um, adults. And uh, there's been a lot of studies to basically demonstrate this, uh, where they'll do things like they'll uh, appraise, they'll, they'll have uh, adolescents um, reappraise their likelihood of crashing if they're drinking, and they'll compare it to adults. And they find that even when presented with new information, it's really hard for adolescents to, to say, okay, well, based on that research, I guess it's not such a good idea. They're more likely to say, but this is me. This could never happen to me because I'm me. Um, and again, this is related to the prefrontal cortex. Now, we did not descend from chimps, but rather we and chimps descended from a common ancestor roughly five million years ago. Um, and he, here are some of our ancestors that we had. The Artipithecus, the Australopithecus, Homo habilis, Homo erectus. And then finally, there's us. And we're going to talk about this in a lot more detail whenever we talk about hominids. Now, evolutionary psychology is not a single theory but a large set of hypotheses, um, and a term that has also come to refer to a particular way of applying evolutionary theory to the mind, with an emphasis on adaptation, gene level selection, as well as modularity. And the neuroscientist Steven Pinker, who 
who's, who's a real icon in our field, uh, was the one who made this proclamation. Now, why do we have larger brains? Well, according to Dunbar's social brain hypothesis, larger brains are needed to maintain social relationships between similar individuals. So primates show a correlation between click size and size of the cortex relative to overall brain size. Makes sense if you think about it. I look back at the people that I grew up with and when you get my age, one of the things that's really fun is like looking back at what you thought the world was like and what actually unfolded. And every once in a while, you'll have a friend who's like voted most likely to succeed, and they don't really succeed as well as other people did. And you start thinking to yourself, like, why are some people a lot more successful in their careers or relationships than others? One of the interesting trends that I found, I was talking with one of my friends who I think she's probably like the most like successful people that's in a field that I fully appreciate. And I remember I was talking with her one time. We were talking about how she has done so well. And uh, she said she thinks the reason is because she really loves people. Sure enough, any time that... I have a question she doesn't know. She always wants me to contact a friend of hers and she'll give me some information about them and, you know, talk about how nice they are. And it's like just being around her opens up a whole social world for her. And it's pretty amazing to me. Um, so I guess you could summarize this with an expression. Um, it's not always what you know. Sometimes it's who you know. And uh, I think that um, this is consistent with this Dunbar social brain hypothesis, which says our brains evolved to be larger so we could know more people. Now, there are other explanations for why we have larger brains. Um, increased size, according to Reader et al., is associated with innovations in behavior, innovative tool use, as well as social learning. Um, but we, in, in evolutionary psychology, we look at all sorts of different roles in evolution, things we evolved, like a language acquisition models. You know, the fact that we're actually wired to absorb language when we're young. My daughter's been in uh, Mandarin um, immersion school now for a year and a half, and... Uh, Friends of ours are talking about how she's becoming fluent. She's not just becoming fluent, she's thinking in Mandarin, according to some of her teachers. If I studied Mandarin for one and a half years, I wouldn't have much to show for it. I've been trying to learn Vietnamese for years now, and it's, it's been really difficult. Language acquisition models account for why uh, children are able to fast map language when they're young and why they have that critical window to acquire it. We also have cheater detection mechanisms. We're going to talk about these, the fact that for males, being able to figure out whether um, someone is a has higher levels of sociosexuality would be at an advantage at, from an evolutionary standpoint. S reverse sexual imprinting, for instance, uh, you know, people never find their siblings attractive. We're going to talk about um, these sorts of things, uh, but they're fascinating topics. We're going to talk about them more when we talk about the evolution of humans. So evolutionary psychology is founded on several core premises. First, the brain is an information processing device and it produces behavior in response to external as well as internal inputs. The brain's adaptive mechanisms were shaped by uh, natural and sexual selection. So it's not just how long you live, it's how many um, offspring you have and whether they survive. Also, different neural mechanisms are specialized for solving problems in humanity's evolutionary past. And sometimes that's a very long time ago. Now, the another idea is that the brain has evolved specialized neural mechanisms that were designed for solving problems that recurred over deep evolutionary time, giving humans sort of a Stone Age minds. And most contents and processes of the brain are unconscious, things that seem like they're so easy to do, um, like walking, 
I mean, we can make little wind-up robots that appear to be walking. But to actually be able to walk over a hard surface with all different textures and obstructions that goes up a hill, um, it, it's a lot more complicated than it sounds. And uh, finally, human psychology consists of many specialized mechanisms, each sensitive to different classes of information. And these mechanisms combine to produce manifest behavior. So uh, we talked about Dunbar's theory about click size and size of cortex. Here's an example. Humans have such a large click size, but the size of their cortex is also a lot larger. If we look at monkeys, we find that they generally also have larger, but not quite as large um, click size and cortex size. But prosimians, on the other hand, they're not nearly as large for uh, click size or size of cortex. So uh, I guess, uh, again, we're, we're not saying that the more Facebook friends you have, the smarter you are, but the more genuine relationships that you have, the, usually the, the smarter, the better off you are. Now, adaptive advantages of a large brain include increased survival and ability for group interaction in humans, as well as innovative behavior, such as use of tools, social learning. This is the bowerbird's nest. The bowerbird actually takes leaves and rocks and sticks and fabric, and it lines them everywhere in an attempt to attract a potential mate. Okay, well, what's so impressive about that? Well, this might be the first time in the evolutionary history where we're actually seeing creativity. And is creativity a, a, a characteristic that would attract potential partners? Of course. There's no shortage of examples when we look at the creative artists like Picasso and Salvador Dali. Um, very attractive, admirable um, characteristic uh, to all people, really, to see if an individual's that creative. And now, large brain size can also predict success in a novel environment, such as uh, introduced bird species, and uh, sexual selection pressures for ability to attract attention, artistry, as well as um, creativity. Um, and it may lead to increased brain size, such as in the bower birds. So when we look back at evolution, as you can see here, uh, this is the path that was taken in evolution. It's really interesting. There's actually a theorist by the name of Kenneth Kidd who was at Yale, and he's a professor emeritus who said that you can actually follow these arrows, and you can actually see different densities of dopaminergic receptors that represent the desire to find greener pastures. Um, so... Um, at any rate, radiocarbon dating shows the colonization of Europe and Asia by Homo sapiens 50,000 years ago. This is actually much more recent than we thought. And differences in skin color, facial features, and stature of inhabitants of those regions have occurred since then, um, and in response to climate conditions as well. So. Now, evolutionary psychology makes light of the observation that natural selection doesn't just work on physical attributes of the organism. So it can also work on psychological. So sociobiology emerged in the scientific literature in the 70s and gave rise to evolutionary psychology. But as far back as 1871, Darwin noted, fitness depends not on a struggle for existence, but on a struggle between the males for possession of females. And the result is not death to the unsuccessful competitor, but few or no offspring. So, and we're going to talk about um, human evolutionary psychology. We're going to talk about kin selection, reverse sexual imprinting. Now, when we talk about animals, there have been some interesting things that have been observed. Now, Sarah Blaffer Hardy documented the male Abu Longer monkeys in India. And uh, in 1977, she documented something that just baffled everybody. These Abu Langer monkeys in India were killing the baby Langer monkeys. And according to evolution, this has no place. I mean, why would they kill the babies? That's not adaptive. Um, so 
to give you a little background, and this is what was discovered, the male Abu Langer monkeys would fight for partners. They were pretty vicious. They had a tournament, and the, the victors, um, basically, after the fight for partners, the conferring victory, they would replace the less dominant male, and if the new partner finishes nursing quicker, they'll return to estrus sooner. So they would actually kill the babies so that the nursing would cease and the ovulation would resume quicker. And if you look at the short period of their breeding uh, window, um, you can see that this put them at a, a much greater advantage for conceiving. So this is not confined to langurs. We see this in gorillas. We see this in many different species. Now, kin selections, the idea in many species, they'll sacrifice themselves for close kin, thereby, thereby propagating a more similar genetic contribution to the gene pool. So, now rats have a major histocompatibility complex that allows them to detect the degree of kinship through pheromones. Um, and likely moderates their preference for related rats. But human beings don't actually have this. Um, so in human beings, um, there are other things um, that are used to detect kinship. Um, but it seems like we have a preference for kin. We like to see them succeed. Um, I don't know if you know this, the, the fast food chain with the most fighting is... Chuck E. Cheese. Well, you can just imagine how that would unfold. Hey, my kid's been waiting here forever for this here video game. Your kid keeps monopolizing it, and now we've got to go, and my poor kid here ruining their birthday. <laughs> so, now some evolution can be rapid, such as overuse of antibiotics speeds evolution of resistant bacteria. I recommend you check out Wikipedia, they have a great example of this. They have a video where they show how to make bacteria that's a thousand times as resistant to antibiotics. It's kind of scary, but it certainly makes a point. Um, bighorn rams have 25% smaller horns, which protects them from being hunted because if the horns aren't long enough, they're um, less likely to be hunted. Some evolution can be rapid. Darwin's finches continue to change in response to food supply, and the largest cod, for instance, are kept in remaining ones uh, mature to smaller sizes. So here's some review questions. Um, adaptations that increase your reproductive capacity but also threaten your longevity. What will we call this? Well, this is called antagonistic pleiotrophy. Um, antagonistic pleiotrophy is whenever something makes us um, more likely to be attractive, but it makes us less healthy. So if cigarette smoking made us look so much more attractive to potential partners, but it made our life much shorter, we could say that preference for cigarettes would be an example of this. Other um, examples have been, um, for instance, in some species, if they have overactive testes, they tend to produce more sperm, but they're at a higher rate of cancer as a result. So now the finding that people who live in close proximity during the first few years of their lives become desensitized to sexual attraction, what's this going to be? Well, this one right here would be the Westermark effect. The Westermark effect is actually um, the finding that individuals who were reared together um, oftentimes would not marry. And this was actually um, found um, in research. Really interesting, the Westermark effect. Also, species of birds that store seeds tend to have an enlarged what? Well, they have to remember where they stored them in order to retrieve them. So we could say that they have an enlarged hippocampus. All mammals have the same brain structures. True or false? I want to say false, but that's actually true. It's the relative size that actually changes. And which is not an example of evolution from this chapter? Well, larger manes of male lions was not discussed. Um, similarity of function, although the structures of interest may look different, we're going to refer to this one um, as 
analogy. And then finally, measure a brain size relative to body size as the encephalization factor. And birds that use grills to collect insects have larger forebrains. So to finish your study review here, what terms used to describe characteristics shared by a set of species but not present in their ancestor? Um, also, what's the term for showing similarities in behavior or structure among unrelated animals due to adaptations to similar environments? What's a term for similarity based on common ancestry? Who discovered the mechanisms of inheritance? What's the main shared feature among vertebrate nervous systems? What's the main, uh, what's a measure of brain size relative to body size? What's the name of a group of hominids that uh, were the first to make and use tools? What's the cost or benefit of having a large brain? What does Dunbar's social brain hypothesis suggest? And finally, what does evolutionary psychology deal with? So hopefully this is useful for you. Thank you. The following lecture is actually going to be on the evolution of hominids, and then we're going to conclude with a lecture on the evolution of human beings. I hope you enjoyed this. I enjoy the fact that we, we have um, this topic of evolution and behavior. I've always found it a very intriguing idea, and I'm, I'm really happy you joined me today. Thank you so much.